Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Art in Perspective. I'm your host, I'm your host, Alaith. On this episode, I have an artist that's not just um, a geometric artist, but also um, an origami artist. And he's a graphic designer, has done many major projects. Um, and he's a teacher of many, many students all around the world. The person I'm talking about today is Mr. Mr. Amit Hindocha. How are you doing, sir? Good, thanks. Yeah, how about you? I'm good. I'm good. How how are things on in in England with the COVID situation? Hopefully, things are. Ah, um, yeah. I mean, things are opening up a little bit this this week or the last week or two. Um, you know what that means in the long run, I don't know, but uh, it's nice to <laughs> be able to see see some people in real life again and move around a little bit. Of course, of course, of course. Uh, I think you guys just came out of your third lockdown. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Hoping we don't end up having another one. Another um, one, yeah. You never know. <laughs> Just yeah. trying to think like two weeks ahead and no more than that at the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can imagine. Um, it, it is tough. It is tough. But uh, I think Zoom has helped out a lot. Zoom and Meet and all these, yeah. um, all these, all these applications have let us, you know, be able to to carry on. I think we're going to talk about some of your um some of your work um during this lockdown period um but before we go into art mm -hmm. and um what your practice is and what you do i just want you to give tell us a, a brief give us a brief a brief background on yourself um so let's start with your name because I, I was looking up your name um actually i wasn't looking up your name to be honest i was looking i was looking up you on the internet and i found out your name mm -hmm. means something tell us what it means Okay, right. um, your first name, Amit, and, um, and then give us a little bit of your background, please. Ah, uh, my name, okay, I thought you meant Ambigraph, the name that I chose. No, 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 you mean my name, my first name. Your name, name. <laughs> my first name, yeah, my first name actually means um, boundless or infinite, mm. which is <laughs> kind of, you know, maybe a, a suggestion of uh, the path to come yeah um yeah in in terms of uh background and stuff i'm a first generation born and brought up in in england in london specifically okay uh my parents well, so my grandparents are from india my parents that uh from east africa so my grandparents moved their parents were born in east africa came to london i would me and my sister were born and brought up here yeah um yeah Okay, so um, first gen, uh, first generation um, Londoner. Um, tell us, um, you went to you went to um, you went to school at um, Surrey Institute, I believe. Yeah, so the Surrey Institute. So this is after school, actually. It's uh, first year after finishing my, you know, uh, finishing high school. Okay, age eighteen. What I, what I did at the Surrey Institute was uh, a one year foundation art and design course. Okay. And at that time, actually, where I the, where I teach at the moment um, on a regular basis at Camberwell College is yeah. a foundation course as well. Yeah. Um, when I studied, it was a compulsory. If you wanted to go into any art and design degree, yeah. you needed a foundation. <clears throat> so it's a year where you are able to explore different practices within art and design because previous to that at school you have art and it can incorporate whatever you know it does have a heavy emphasis on painting and drawing and a bit of sculpture and I did do a bit of photography but it doesn't really give you a sense of the scope of art and design and all the various specialisms within that so the foundation course is is kind of an essential stage in the um, art and design education uh so you know it gave me a chance to explore different processes different techniques different ways of thinking and i think i wasn't completely switched on to the applied arts you know graphic design illustration that kind of territory and i found you know i i think the main thing i got out of that year was realizing that that slightly more structured approach was what appealed to me so you know that that kind of urged me on to study graphic design Okay, so you ended up after that one year of, of a foundation, you ended up going to Camberwell College, right, to study graphic yeah, design. Yeah, 
Yeah, I did a, a, a slightly strange course, actually. It was graphic design and painting. So it was half applied art, half fine art, um, which I, you know, again, I don't think I really had the context of that while I was doing it. Um, but looking back, I think my emphasis was more on, on painting at that point. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I at least got some sort of grounding in graphic design and understanding that that sort of uh, method of thinking where you you are given a brief, you have a structure to work within yeah. and the exploration happens within that. Whereas in the fine art practice, you are kind of doing that, but you're finding your own, your own interest and building on that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the degree that I did there. Okay. All right. So you, after, so you ended up getting a graphic design degree um, and you, you end up working immediately for um for a couple of um food companies i believe yeah a rubicon and a rubicon and um, yeah. shanna foods yeah so that was uh it was through a family friend who who was the uh director and started up these companies rubicon in particular okay um so i you know it was Excellent. Having that opportunity because I was I was the in-house designer, you know, with <laughs> very little experience, yeah. but being given the opportunity to be thrown into a much more commercial setup. Um, you know, it wasn't in any way the kind of uh, open ended creative exploration that happens on a degree. Uh, it was very you know, practical, grounded in the sort of marketing. And also I basically, I learned Illustrator, you know, I hadn't really used Illustrator before that. So I, it gave me a chance to learn those skills right directly in the job. Um, also learning about print, uh, going and visiting, um, uh, you know, printing companies, discussing with them how to prepare artwork. Yeah. So I got this much more like commercial, applied practical kind of grounding doing doing that role for a couple of years mm. so so you said that you 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 just you you learned in that position you learned how to use illustrator and what have you um mm. so you didn't learn that while in school so no <laughs> so what, what did you learn then what did you learn what did i learn no, because I, I, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound a little um you know um, weird but i i mean uh, maybe I'm, I'm younger than you but i remember that this was like the foundation of graphic design for us right um this is early to yeah. right um it was illustrator photoshop InDesign, all these programs um so what was it like when you were you studied well, so, I mean, I, I did the, the degree from uh, 97 to 2000, you know, digital okay. media, but there were only a few computers in the college. It was okay. starting to become more of a thing, but not completely embedded. And to be honest, I think the emphasis um, on the degree at the time, and even often these days, uh, the emphasis is on developing your ideas. Okay. Uh, the practical skills that I learned there were fairly minimal, actually, and most of what I know uh, and what I've learned and developed skills-wise yeah. has happened after that. So we we didn't really have classes in how to use Illustrator and InDesign. Mm. Uh, it's hard to say. To be honest, I, you know, I I would say I was a slow starter. You know, I, the school I went to was very academically focused. Okay. Uh, I was lucky to have, you know, uh, being being Indian, having parents who, you know, their emphasis was on academic study, but they, uh, I was very lucky they were actually open minded enough to, uh, you know, accept me following a kind of art and design route. Okay. But I think, you know, I, w I was average as a student at that point. Um, you know, it's and but luckily, I, I got this opportunity to go straight into uh, a creative job. I know, you know, probably most of the people I studied with had to go and get other jobs and maybe didn't get an opportunity to return to something creative. So, you know, I think that was a, a good, um, a good opportunity and a chance to kind of persist with this. Um, so, so yeah, I think yeah, a lot of what I've learned skills wise has happened after the degree. Uh, you know, degree was definitely conceptually grounded. 
Well, and was this really what you were looking for in, in the, by going into graphic design and getting the design um, the degree? Were you looking to get a job like that of Ruby Khan and Shanna Foods? Or were you... Kind of. Okay. Kind of. I mean, I think uh, at that point, it was just, you know, this opportunity is here. I'll just, I'll do okay. that. It's fine. And I, and I did learn a lot doing it. However, I was the one uh, designer and fresh out of university yeah. uh, within a company where no, no one else was doing a creative role like that, a visually okay. oriented role. So I was working in, in, I mean, I was basically part of the marketing department. So I, I was very much doing what I was asked. Okay. Um, not a lot of creative, uh, you know, direction from from me. You know, I was having to, and also it's uh, we're talking about you know packaging design for beverages and stuff. There isn't it. Certain things have to be done in certain ways. You know, you have a certain amount of space on the can has to have the ingredients on it. You know, this yeah. kind of thing it has to be readable and it has to work in the colors that were being printed and the technique that's being used for printing so you know there are a lot of limitations but I, I don't that was still that was fine I, I found I had other outlets which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute um, mm. for more of my you know creative uh, my own personal creative direction mm. okay so you ended up later on you ended up um, going back to Camberwell mm -hmm. um, as a tutor yeah yeah. So how how did that come about? Come about like um because it's, it's well, so I so I actually I had go ahead go ahead sorry uh, yeah I I had a um so after I think with with the job at Rubicon I was traveling quite a lot and I think after a couple of years I was kind of getting tired of of that and I wanted to actually rather than being an in house designer for one company. Yeah, I had in mind to sort of try and get work with a design agency where I would get a wider range of um, experience and also be working alongside more experienced designers and being able to learn from them how that kind of world, how that industry works. Okay. Um, so I had, yeah, a little period of time where I was just doing various temp jobs. Um, and then uh, I ended up, taking on this role at Wimbledon College. So Campbell, the return to Campbell happened because the foundation course at Wimbledon uh, merged with the one at Campbell. Okay. Uh, some years later, just in 2011. So, you know, 10 years ago from now. Um, so I was initially at Wimbledon. But, you know, during this whole period, so, you know, working in that kind of technical role, helping students uh, to develop their making skills, mainly with the digital focus at that time um, and helping them, you know, helping them develop their, how, how they make their work, uh, the technical side of it, rather than the conceptual development. Uh, that meant that I was increasing my skills all the time, you know, getting more and more, you know, I've always found that teaching gives me a huge amount of um, clarity. I have to be able to understand what I'm doing to the point where I can explain it simply mm. to someone else, which increases, you know, you really have to immerse yourself. Yeah. So in terms of software, in terms of animation skills, photography, I mean, all kinds of disciplines. Okay. Um, I was building my skills. I, it, again, though, it's not an outlet for my own creative work. So at that time, sort of through the 2000s, the main outlet I had creatively was I was involved with, um, Adverse Cambo, which was a, a collective, uh, kind of creative collective that I was involved with, with a bunch of friends. Um, a lot of, we were all doing creative stuff. A lot of them were musicians. We were putting on parties and events, uh, quite a heavy focus on experimental electronic music. Um, yeah. I was DJing a lot within that, which was, uh, you know, it's kind of, although I'm, I'm generally an introspective person, there was something about the kind of performative aspect of, of DJing that, and, the, and the sort of time-based aspect of it, which I, was, I got a lot out of. Okay. Uh, I was also doing the graphics, designing flyers, you know, and for stuff that I really had a passion about, about okay. the music. Uh, and also um, audiovisual work, so moving image, creating um, this kind of full experience, you know, an audiovisual experience. And I think most importantly, developing a sense of aesthetics, you know, the kind of um, 
things that I liked visually, building my skills and building a sense of, of narrative. You know, there's in a, in a, across a period of time, you're expressing an idea and it comes kind of in a performative way, not so much me standing on stage performing, although there is an aspect of that with DJing. Um, but that's stuff which I think has informed everything I've done since, you know, and even going up to the, the teaching that I do now, there's definitely a performative aspect to teaching. And there's also a narrative, you know, you're communicating something across time, you're delivering um, a sequence of ideas and those ideas become clear. You know, you, the way that you present everything helps the student or the, uh, the viewer, reader, receiver of the information to understand, you know, so there's very much a kind of communication aspect to it, visual communication. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. So that all played uh, quite a role in that. I mean, I'm still at teaching at Camberwell. Uh, half my half my week is there, um, and it's it's incredibly valuable in terms of um, yeah. Just it it means I'm constantly needing to stay on top of my my skills, yeah. um, and it's also it's a creative role. And it gives me the space in the rest of my week to to build. You know, it's, it gives me a regular income and, yeah. and I kind of I'm in I'm involved in a creative world. You know, I'm in a building with lots of student, fresh students every year, and my colleagues who are also creatives from all different disciplines. So you know, it's a good environment. It feeds in very much, always has into my own practice, and gives me that kind of financial support and steadiness that means i can make certain choices in the work in the yeah. freelance work i do okay nice nice yes and i will talk about we'll talk about your freelance work later um mm -hmm. but um after after a couple of years in particularly in 2014 mm. something happened there right you said you mentioned <laughs> yeah. that you needed to reinforce and reinvigorate your creative process what happened there tell us what happened there and what that led to yeah, so I, I, uh, I guess sort of towards the end of the 2000s, by about 2010, you know, hit, hit, hitting my 30s and okay. less stamina for partying and all of that stuff. Okay. Um, and I wanted to focus more on my on my visual practice. Um, so I, I think around, you know, for the first few years, you know, from 2010, I guess I was, I was focusing more on my visual practice, you know, in design practice. Um, I, you know, from way back from, from during my degree, I had developed a kind of clear interest in natural, in nature, pattern from nature, mathematics, structure, order, symmetry, these kinds of things. And I was exploring them, but they felt very disconnected and disparate. But okay. in 2014, I felt like things were starting to kind of close in on something. Um, yeah. You know, these things are easier to perceive with hindsight. Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to say this clearly at the time, but I felt like it was heading somewhere. I needed something to help pull it together. Um, I was doing a lot more printmaking, so again, like getting hands involved, okay. uh, not just working digitally, trying to make this sort of more direct connection with the work I was making. Yeah. Um, and, and definitely using geometry, but I, I feel in an uninformed way. Um, so I, and I was, you know, because of the nature and natural pattern side of things, I, I wanted to take a course and I'd been looking at, you know, botanical illustration as a possible thing to just have a little explore with and see if it helps give me some focus. Yeah. And a colleague of mine mentioned this um, <clears throat> this course, uh, Geometry in the Order of Nature at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in London. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that immediately, it, it sounded ideal, you know, geometry, okay. which I, I, I thought, it, uh, to my mind, I was thinking, all right, this will help give my graphic design practice a little more of a, a cohesive element to it. Okay. Uh, I didn't really, I wasn't prepared for <laughs> how much of an impact it had. Okay. Uh, a lot of that is down to Tom, Tom Bree, who taught the course, who, yeah. I mean, he's a very um, sort of inspiring and, and gentle teacher. You know, he, he opened 
my eyes to, you know, I, I knew that I would click with geometry because of, as I said before, about having boundaries, having a framework to be creative within has always okay. worked better for me than just having complete openness. Okay. So I, I felt that, you know, geometry was something I'd had this kind of loose interest in, but I, you know, I thought if I develop some better, clearer understanding of a method to approach this as an artistic practice, it might help my design work. It might help me design better logos and be more informed about that. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, I was waiting for some kind of catalyst and what Tom did, which I think any, any, you know, like really excellent teacher will spark something inside you. And I yeah. think this thing was latent there waiting for that to be, to be lit up. And I yeah. think he did that. And one of the main things was not just the, the system and the structure and the order of how to approach uh, drawing geometry, but he's very, uh, he's got a way with explaining the contemplative, philosophical, you know, metaphysical aspect of the art form. And that really was a big part of what clicked with me. You know, it tied in with my my sort of worldview again which I don't think it really crystallized uh so you know it brought together this kind of meaning aspect of things the uh, the mathematics and the rigor of it yeah the practice of drawing you know working with hands working with simple tools and then you know I found every pattern I, I just had a million ideas for how to apply it because okay. there's you know, there's that stage as well the application once you have a pattern you can apply you can uh, render it in different media uh, using different materials using different tools all of this stuff really pulled together through doing this uh, through doing this course so yeah I mean I, I was quickly obsessed you know a month into the course I was dreaming about it I was mm. Uh, you know i was hooked <laughs> you know it is a, there's an element of addiction you know it's it's mostly healthy except when it's not you know it's, there are times when it's uh i i still i'm i'm still learning to just leave it alone sometimes um because okay. yeah I, I can just get very very addicted to the the buzz of new explorations and all of that yeah. stuff wow 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 so how how long was how long did this course last uh, this was uh, one evening a week for, I think it must have been eight weeks, 10 weeks, something like that. So okay. throughout the year, this was from September to the end of the year. Okay. Uh, I straight away signed up for uh, another course with Tom the next term, starting in January with yeah. uh, looking at the golden ratio. Okay. Uh, um, you know, by that point, I was already um, analyzing the patterns myself. I'd also started my... I, I started posting on Instagram at the, at the time. I thought, oh, I've actually got something to show and it had come up in a few conversations. I thought, all right, I'll post the things that I'm making on this course. That's a starting okay. point. Okay. Um, you know, again, I didn't really have any idea that it would have such an influence on me, give me so much inspiration. You know, so already by the time I was taking this second course, I was finding... Uh, I was I was connecting with a community of other artists uh, okay. it also involved in this and starting to realize that there was this kind of uh, analytical aspect to it, you know, like trying to the, the puzzle side of things, you know, like looking at the patterns, trying to figure it out. I could yeah. see that there was some system going on. Um, and that's what was really sparking my interest. Like, how can I understand how these things come about? And how can I then explore within that to discover my own stuff? Oh. Um, so, yeah, building this kind of community through Instagram, um, becoming very inspired by other people uh, on there. You know, often, especially in the early first couple of years I was on there, I would open it, see something. And then that's, that was that, you know, that day I had to figure out whatever that thing was yeah. uh, that I'd seen. And so, I mean, I learned a huge amount through, through this kind of dialogue. And it's actually what even more powerfully, I think with Instagram, I've made real world connections. You know, I, I know a lot of people in person now through that um, who share this passion and interest in Islamic geometry or in, in geometry in general as an artistic yeah. practice. Uh, and that's been a very powerful influence for me. Yeah. Wow. Um, 
and then actually one other one other key thing was the following year um to end of 2015 i met david sutton yeah. um <clears throat> through a conversation with tom so i'd asked tom something and he said oh the person to ask is david and he'd emailed him on my behalf and eventually at the end of that year we we met uh and he offered to take me on as a student okay um and at this point you know this started to confirm to me that this was not just a hobby or a passing interest you know that mm. what i felt deeply within myself was actually more than that was more of a calling mm. um you know having this developing this connection with Dode has really helped confirm that given me some strength to stick with this and and keep persisting and with the you know with the backup of having a paid job for half the week and having the time in the other half I was able to just let let those things I was able to just explore you know for definitely for the first two three years I just made stuff explored geometry didn't really worry about um what was I going to do with it how was I going to turn it into money I, I purposefully put that on a shelf and just yeah developed my my skill developed my practice wow. so yeah it's another key key sort of uh stage in the journey wow 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 so it had a deep impact on you um is it fair to say that after that point most you mostly left graphic work and you focus more on handmade handmade work like what we see behind you in terms of the geometry and even origami work and what have you uh partly i mean i would say that i i moved my emphasis away from you know when people approach me to design logos or websites i yeah. felt this i had a slight sinking feeling frankly you know it's sort of it was paid work and i wanted to do it for that reason but i was yeah. not feeling it anymore okay i didn't really want to do that so i definitely moved gradually away from doing graphic design work on, and I think, you know, the kind of area I was doing, I was working with small businesses who often don't have, there's not a lot of budget, there's not yeah. a lot of ability, you know, occasionally you would have an, an excellent client. And I did some work for record labels where I was very satisfied with the way that we interacted and the creative aspect of it. But, you know, the, the sort of jobbing design stuff, you know, left me cold and I wanted to spend mm. my time exploring geometry mm. um with regards to the handmade side of things i i was working by hand a lot but i was also using illustrator and other animation tools right from the beginning you know because i had all those making skills already okay uh i've i've always found that working by hand and working on computer you know in just in terms of drawing if we if we just talk about that part having those two elements is is key Okay. Bringing bringing the two aspects together, um, the way that drawing something by hand informs and feeds into the digital drawing and back and forth, uh, I've I've found that has been a huge impetus. It's, it's pushed me uh, to develop my understanding. Um, so so yeah, I haven't moved away from digital work i have moved away from kind of standard graphic design work but yeah i still use computers extensively in mm. my work okay uh, origami is a more recent development um i think i just probably a year and a half ago i i reached a point where i felt my my obsession with islamic geometry had died down enough to allow space for paper folding which i'd always had this interest in i okay. you know know quite a few people who do it and was seeing more and more work on um uh on instagram and places and i'd also in istanbul i'd met eric gierde and taken one of you know was, was who was also presenting at an event there um and that you know that was just a reminder like yeah at some point i want to get into this and then in the last in, especially in the last year with the lockdown, with having children at home all the time, yeah. not being able to get in the studio and sit down and focus on a drawing, having a piece of paper on the shelf that I can just pick up and play with has been, you know, that's kept me sane, kept me practicing, okay. kept me playing with geometry. So that stuff, uh, yeah, I guess in the last year and a half, I've really immersed in that and found it again and just a hugely 
satisfying connected way of exploring geometry mm-hmm. yeah speaking, speaking of satisfaction you know i've spoken mm-hmm. to um other graphic designers i actually spoke to one graphic designer who's an artist now doing a lot of mm-hmm. um, calligraphy uh, modern calligraphy or what have you and he said that um he said that he felt that um even though and you've mentioned that you know you liked a structural approach to things uh, being confined somewhat that kind of helped you um he was like the redundancy of having to you know having to go back to a client um and and you know and the client tells you this and then you have to do that and it's he felt it was he, he couldn't explore a lot of what we've been talking about now he couldn't explore and that and that kind of after a while got to him and he was yeah. like you know what i i really need to just break free yeah did you feel did you feel somewhat the same absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. I, I, I think in, I was getting that creative outlet through the Adverse Camber Collective for some time. Yeah. And then as that started coming to an end, you know, I, I think, yeah, that's absolutely right. You, when you get an excellent client where they understand, where they leave you the, where they give you enough structure to help guide your exploration, but they leave you to, do the exploration um then it can be a very fruitful relationship but those are few and far between often Mm. you know you will do something for solid creative reasons but in the end you know someone in the marketing department decides this is how things need to be and so yeah there is a lack of um there is a lack of creative freedom in mo- in most graphic design. You know, I, I think so where, where things have changed for me is by focusing on uh, developing my geometric skill yeah. when I now get approached and, I, you know, I've, I can I can pick and choose a lot more what I want to do. Mostly I won't do that kind of work, um, okay. but it's it's got to the point where I think I've built up enough of a reputation that people will come to me because they want something with that geometric flavor. And they're, mm. they're therefore more respectful of leaving, you know, of, of accepting that I, that's why they're coming to me for that understanding. Yeah. So when, when those elements are in, in there, you know, so, I mean, as a, good, a great example was uh, doing work for Homeland, the TV show Homeland, yes. um, you know, that was, a big show, a big, um, you know, a lot of people involved in the approval process who yes. I, I was liaising with one or two people, but they were, I know they were going to meetings with whole boards of marketing people. And uh, so even within that, I did have to make certain compromises, certain directions I wouldn't have gone in, but I, I advised knowledgeably on what I you know why I ch- made certain choices and then I, I'm happy to make it how they how they feel they want it yeah. but they also did um you know uh come to me for the understanding that I had not because I was just someone who could essentially use creative software and put something visual yeah, together yeah, yeah. And they, something higher going on there so yeah, yeah. so there's still you know I think the design skills are came into play but I think I'm in, I'm in a much I uh, feel in a much stronger position to choose what I want to do if it's a design job and to uh, incorporate my skills and passion into how it how it kind of turns out yeah um, yeah nice nice um, so uh, after taking this course with um, Tom Bree and going through and being the out sudden and you know, developing, developing this addiction for the, for the arts and what have you. Sometime later, you end up getting some, some, um, some, some um, invitations to different mm. countries to, to yeah. give lectures and to teach and what have you, uh, particularly Istanbul, which you mentioned earlier. Um, mm. how, did, how did these opportunities come up? Were you looking for them? And, um, and tell us how was the, the experience was. Okay, yeah. Uh... I, w- I wasn't looking for them. In fact, one thing that I think I've, that I've, I've done very much since uh, getting involved in this practice is I've just relaxed and let things come to me. Um, I, I haven't really gone out looking for stuff. Uh, okay. Most of the opportunities have come by the fact that I 
immerse myself in the work and I put it out into the world in some form okay. <clears throat> so people find it. And with regards to the Istanbul trips, um, Professor Mirek Majelski, uh, who's a, a, a geometer uh, and is involved with the Istanbul Design Center. Okay. Uh, he approached me. I mean, it, I think he just saw my work on Facebook, Instagram, wherever. Um, and also, I, he must have been aware that I uh, that I taught already. So we ended up um, having a discussion. He invited me to come and give a little talk about my work and teach a class at the the first time I went. Uh, you know, I mean, it was an honor to to be there and to be involved with, uh, especially with you know, uh, a bunch of people who <clears throat> have been probably doing it a lot longer than me. Mm. I felt a bit out of my depth and I certainly, uh, you know, not, uh, I, I kind of, when it, with regards to teaching, I get in a flow, mm. but with regards just standing on a stage and speaking about stuff, I mean, that's not uh, my natural <laughs> environment by any okay. means. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's good to put yourself out of your comfort zone and, yeah. um you know, Istanbul, it was a chance to visit Istanbul, which is a beautiful city, very inspiring, going, you know, having a bit of time to go and visit places. Yeah. Um, you know, that that part was great as well. Um, so and and it just, you know, each thing I do gives me one one step of more developed understanding. You know, it's part of the, the, all these things are part of a journey. So um uh, you know, I would absolutely do everything I did the first time differently now, but I now have a few more years experience. So, you know, it, it played a, a good role in, again, you know, that confirmation that I'm on the right path, you know, I'm doing something, I'm doing something right, you know, I've been asked to do this thing because I'm immersing myself in this yeah. practice. Um, the second time the second time was more nerve-wracking I actually I, I mainly gave a talk in front of a couple of hundred non-English speakers standing on a big stage in a fancy auditorium you know I'd never really done anything like that as yeah. kind of and then straight the minute I came off stage a local newspaper asked to interview me you know it was all like I'm not but I'm I what I felt after was that I uh I'm I'm sort of connected enough and and truly passionate about what I'm doing that it's not a big deal. Mm. Yeah, I, I don't need to be prepared. I I can kind of you know I I could just speak about this stuff. Uh, yeah. So that felt oh, obviously I did need to <laughs> prepare for the talk. I didn't oh, just turn yeah, up. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> but you know just in the sense of just um, you know again yeah just confirmation that I'm, yeah. I'm doing the right thing and it was yeah wonderful experience both times really yeah, um yeah. second time as well meeting Eric yeah day was was great you know that that was a, okay. another catalyst to me getting into origami and that's been very fruitful as well so okay wow wow I, I imagine that being in Istanbul first of all Istanbul is is very much if not the center at least one of the major centers of of Islamic arts in general, right? Um, so our traditional arts, um, right? So you must have seen a lot in terms of where you explored and what have you, right? Mm. Um, and being able, being honored to be able to come there in front of people that I mean, I I, I used to be, I used to live there as well. I know that mm. they have they have many major major schools where people get their degrees in these traditional arts, right? They get four year degrees yeah. and masters and what have you. So being being called over must mean that you you are definitely on the right path, <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so much stuff there. I, you know, in London, there's some examples, some wonderful examples at the Victoria and Albert Museum. But yeah. you know, we don't have sites. We don't have historical sites, um, Islamic sites. Um, the only other place I'd visited since getting into this art form was the Alhambra, which, you know, I mean, it's had a huge impact. Yeah. Uh, I went on the Art of Islamic Pattern trip there, okay. coordinated with meeting Daoud. So I, I had like a double whammy of <clears throat> doing the course yeah. with Adam and Richard. Yeah. Um, and staying with Daoud in his flat. And then after wow. doing the course, I went with him to the mountains where his studio is, okay. spent a whole week or a few days with him um you know getting really deeply into it so that was you know a huge 
thing, but Istanbul was the only other place really that I've gone and seen this stuff, historical sites in the flesh. Yeah. And there's so much amazing, amazing work out there. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's just a joy really to be able to go and see that stuff. Wow, wow, wow. Um, well, I, 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 sh I guess I should have asked you earlier about this, but um, Ambigraph, Ambigraph came up at what time, right? This um, obviously you're doing Twitter, you're doing obviously doing freelance work, but um, setting up this this entity, if you will, called Ambigraph. Yeah. Where did the name come from, and um, and what inspired that? So uh, it was in 2010. Um. So my wife is a photographer okay. and we had the idea that, you know, she's looking for freelance work as a photographer. I'm looking yeah. for freelance work as a graphic designer. Okay. They're actually, we at the, at the thinking at the time was these are quite compatible and okay. we package ourselves as a unit and present okay. this as a, as a service. You know, you can have one or the other, or you can have both. And because we work together, uh, we will understand your, you know, we'll be able to develop, d deliver a more connected outcome. Yeah. Uh, so that was the thinking, the ambi graph name, you know, the ambi bit, the, the prefix kind of relates to um, two things or both, yeah. you know, in, in the sense of like ambidextrous, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. The graph bit is to do with mark making drawing you know and it kind of tied in with graphic and photography okay. so that so that's where that came from in the end i uh so we did that for a few years i think it was maybe a bit of a misfire i think i was still searching for okay. this kind of focus this core that everything came out of which is what happened a few years later okay. uh i think as i hit that point of getting into geometry and wanting to realign how I presented myself I kind of thought about the name again and we decided that actually it doesn't work so well for what, what my wife was doing okay you know she changed the emphasis of what she was doing a bit as well and so she has a separate name and I kept ambigraph and you know for a while I just thought well I'll just stick with using that name for now you know I, I got used to it I liked it I hadn't got bored of it uh, but actually, even the meaning, you know, at the ambi bit can not only relate to both and bringing together two things, which also relates to the kind of digital analog synthesis, yeah. Yeah. but also um, ambi can be to do with around, you know, ambient. Um, okay. Yeah, the ambience. Okay. So that that kind of connection with the circle and the center, I think, mm. is sort of suggested in that. So I sort of stuck with it. But anyway, so after after I did this course with Tom and just like when I started the Instagram, I started with the name Ambigraph. I know I've just stuck with it. You know, I think names after a while, the meaning isn't really relevant. It's just, you know, it becomes what you're you, you associate with. And, uh, you know, I if I if I hadn't liked the word just for the word that it is, I yeah. would have stopped using it. But I, I'm fine with it. So that's kind of um okay. state as it is yeah okay okay um so i mean throughout your 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 journey right mm. um what what do you wish you knew in the beginning that you know now is one thing that you wish you knew uh yeah i think creatively um not to overthink uh in fact, to think as little as possible and just make stuff, you know, when you start making and you keep making things, um, the thinking happens, you know, the think making is a way of thinking. Okay. And the fact is when you make stuff, you get better at whatever your, your chosen craft is and your, the, your intentions become clearer. Everything becomes clear through the process of making and the thinking happens within that. If you sit and think about making work, but you don't actually make it, you sort of aren't really. And I, I've, I've got notes in sketchbooks from when I was uh, doing my degree saying something similar, you know, do do something. Don't think about it. Just yeah. do it. Um, but it's taken me a long time to reach the point where I, I understood that. Yeah. And part of that also tying in with that is um, is to not focus on outcomes. 
just to just to make stuff and keep making because the um you know the the thinking happens through the making process yeah. and it happens in a clearer way and often it actually happens through your hands in a kind of wordless way as well you mm. know when you intellectualize everything you sort of shut out the intuitive possibility as well and i think bringing those together through making is is where you know you improve your skills you get better at making things but also not putting the focus on the outcomes you know seeing them as indicators of the journey and just stages along along a process uh so you know always always good to push yourself and not settle for substandard work but also yeah. not to expect this kind of perfect result you know every everything you make you will improve for the next time you make something uh, so so i think yeah not overthinking just making stuff being the core of any sort of creative practice uh, and not expecting perfection those are the, you know if i'd if i'd known that i mean i sort of did know that and people would will tell you these things so i'm not yeah. sure me saying it is going to necessarily make it clear for someone else uh because i think you need to feel this and experience it really to to kind of get a sense of um of why it works you yeah. know yeah. so what you mentioned earlier um mm. that you you initially you eventually ended up putting up some of your work that you you had um created during the the course on Instagram or what have you. Um, mm. Do you feel like um, doing that helps you and informs your practice in any way? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, definitely, yeah. I think, uh, you know, at first it was, and it still is actually as much of a, a documentation, like a kind of diary. Uh, mm. or, and it's now looking back, you know, six, seven years worth of uh, of posts I can I can see this kind of trajectory and I can look at it and it reminds me of certain avenues of thought that I went down or um, so yeah it's it's uh, a good place to have this sort of documentation of the whole journey um, and also yeah I think very much in terms of connecting with this wider community having a mm. sense and I think you know I probably a lot of people involved in geometry find that uh you know other people in your life don't want to hear about it <laughs> you're talking about this kind of detail about this stuff and you know people tend to if someone if when people get into geometry they get obsessed it's it's a very easy mm. thing to if you if you click with it yeah for you know often for similar reasons that you you the the kind of structure of it the the rigor of it appeals the possibilities the mathematics you know different aspects may have appeal to different people but i think the when it clicks people get very obsessive about it and um you know making that connection with other like-minded people is is a great way to feel you know connected to things hmm. uh so it definitely i think instagram has a has a value in that hmm. speaking of being addicted and being connected or what have you what do you think is the is the is the addictive part of geometric pattern geometric work yeah um so i think that for for a non-practitioner i think you know they are universally seen as beautiful patterns i think most people find them beautiful okay and there's a there's this sense of symmetry there's the sense of order complexity um uh, structure, beauty, all these things come into it. And so on the surface level, I think most people find that that is appealing. Yeah. Uh, uh, as a, as a practitioner, um, from my point of view, there are a number of kind of stages of the process. Uh, you have the, the sort of idealized geometry that, and, and the numbers, you know, that can only really exist in the imagination. Hmm then you have the imperfect rendition that manifests when you when you draw but you know when you draw you have to make something imperfect for example you know the line in the idealized uh you know the the actual euclidean definition of a line is that it it extends infinitely in each direction okay. and has no thickness now the minute you actually draw a line it has not only thickness, but you know, 
sheet of paper is not even two dimensional. It's actually got thickness itself. Yeah. When you make a mark, you're indenting into the paper. You are applying, you know, ink or pencil that has a thickness onto the surface. Yeah. You know, so there is this. You're immediately realizing this perfect ideal into an imperfect world. Into in, it has to have that imperfection. Uh, then there's the aspect of it with the the application side of things so you know uh how you can take that pattern and use different tools and materials you know uh, uh, yeah so i th i think the it's it's you kind of go through all of these stages and it's that fact that it encompasses all of these aspects it's the whole process and working through this whole process that i find you know is stimulating and enriching and rewarding um and even thinking about geometry itself, you know, what, what the process you go through is you establish a matrix of lines and circles. Yeah. Uh, the word matrix coming from, from the Latin for mother. And then you, from the matrix, you extract a pattern and pattern comes from the word for father. Mm. So it's the mother and father, you know, you're, you're starting with the imagination and you're birthing the pattern you know the 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 uh yeah the it's it's birthed through the application of materials mm. so you know the sort of tying into i don't know an insight i've had into the creative process through the, through doing this work is that it's actually very simple it's very simple but very elusive that um all that you have in the creative process is you have ideas and you realize the ideas yeah and when you do that, you get more ideas and the whole thing just loops around. Mm. Uh, now, the way that you and th this is if you, if you look at it as a game or a dance or whatever, the, the way that you interact with this game is by using tools, materials and processes. Yeah. You know, the tool is a way of extending the capabilities of your hand to manipulate the material uh, to allow to realize the idea. Yeah. And then each time you do that, more ideas come and it like very much like a tree, you know, I, mm. I, I, and I've, I've had to, this is part of the obsessive addictive part is that it keeps branching out yeah. and where it becomes a bit unhealthy for me is that that tips into uh, becoming overwhelming. And this is what I've spent a few years kind of learning to balance out a little more because i now can accept that i will never explore all the ideas i've got written <laughs> down or all the new ones that will come because you know each each idea when you make it branches out into another 10 and another 10 and another 10 and frankly the structure of geometry is is endlessly variable i mean it's oh. even that idea really blows my mind that the line and the arc these two elements interacting on a two dimensional surface, you know, we're not even getting into three dimensions yeah. or uh, other, other things, just the line and the arc two dimensions it is absolutely endless. And even within that, you can, you can limit that and say, all right, I'm only going to work with a circle divided into 10. And even within that it's endless. So, you know, just accepting the fact that it's, it's just going to keep going sure, and yeah. just do just keep making stuff and don't sort of uh, worry about it too much is, is sort of <laughs> what I've realized slowly. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. I, I like that. Um, I like that. I like that intuitive, I know, um, that, um, that deep, deeper look into the, into the, into this type of art and the matrix mm -hmm. and the pattern. That's very insightful. Um, so if, um, Sorry, um, with the, um, with um, teaching, obviously we 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 mentioned earlier that you do um, Canva well, and mm. um, which merge with Wimbledon and what have you. Um, are you doing any online now? Any courses online, and how are those going? Yeah, I've uh, I have started. Yeah, I mean I, I've been in a lucky position that um, having uh, a lot of support from. Uh, Lisa DeLong, who works at the Prince's School, you know, she really encouraged me uh, to um, start teaching geometry, you know, ge geometric drawing classes. Um, so I I've had the opportunity and being, again, fortunately positioned in London, where there seems to be a lot of 
buzz around you know a lot of stuff going on the prince's school uh you know richard and adam's venture uh daniel and his um sacred art of geometry school you know the, all these things are all going on in and around london and i've been able to have an outlet for teaching this stuff face to face and i very much feel that that engagement when you're in a space with people you know the stuff transmits in a way you know not everything is has to be explained in words you know a lot of it comes through just being together and looking and observing and um so when when all this uh pandemic and being stuck at home stuff started happening you know all my all my sort of teaching possibilities for last year got shelved yeah um and i wasn't that keen initially to go down the online route but you know bit by bit i kind of got a decent enough setup we got good lighting microphone you know being able to switch between screen because you know another thing the way the way that i teach is not just you know there's the me drawing live part yeah. but i very much i'm interested because of this background in visual communication to use um to use you know i always have a projector on and i'll be showing stuff whether it's photos illustrations animations any any other visual communication that will aid the understanding for the yeah. student uh to go alongside seeing it being drawn by hand which i think really is the core of the practice and a core of the understanding will come just drawing by hand ruler and compass you know that's like really essential if you want to get deep into this stuff um so yeah so then it's it's taken me some time to get to the point where i felt like i had a good setup and that i would be willing to give it a go did a couple of things with the princess school and then decided to have a go at doing my own course so i, I did this uh silver ratio grid system which is a, a bit of research i did uh, yeah. so i've ran that course twice and actually i found while teaching in a physical space you know that that kind of uh the the sort of magic that happens in the air of being being in proximity with people yeah um that doesn't happen online in the same way but by keeping the numbers lowish and and you know having people uh visible you know people if they're when they're comfortable encourage people to keep their cameras on and to yeah. speak up instead of just using the chat window it, yeah. it gets as close as we can get in this way and then i've seen that there's actually a benefit in that um you can you can manipulate what you're showing on the screen and you yeah. can do it in perhaps more detail than sometimes is possible in a classroom yeah. and also in terms of connecting you know the people that I've taught in the past at Prince's School and with Daniel, you know, they tend to be people who are either close enough to the school to come there and study or who can afford to travel to London, stay there for a period of time and take a course, yeah. which cuts out a huge number of people. And then, you know, in most parts of the world, there aren't, there isn't access to uh, places where you can learn Islamic geometry. It's quite a niche subject. Um, yeah. So opening up this global audience who were already there, ready and waiting on Instagram was like, yeah. oh, this is actually quite sensible, you know? So I've, you know, had people from Canada to Indonesia on the, on the same course, you know, completely different times of day, but we're all there yeah. kind of together in it, together, at least in, in a form of space, a yeah. uh, virtual yeah. space, but it's still, so I am st I've started to see that there is an opportunity for for connection and for learning in in that in this environment uh, as well. And plus, I can do it in my slippers and have a two minute walk, like what thirty second walk back home. So you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. not having to travel and all that stuff. You know, there are advantages to the way these things are set up. Yeah. That said, you know, I'm looking forward to you know what are some of the best teaching experiences like when we did the course uh, it with Dowd and. Uh, Samira and Alan and Rajan, we all did, did this course in Spain a couple yeah. of years ago. You know, I mean, that was, a, a, a again, a really incredible experience to spend that much time focused and immersed in one location with a group of people who are all there to, to sort of, uh, you know, 
immerse themselves as well within within this art you know that's not the same when you do a zoom for a couple of hours and then get on with your life so you know i, I think there's a balance i think uh, we'll find a a way of incorporating all the all the good stuff and and uh you know keep building on that so when when you start teaching those courses what's the first thing you tell your students the very first thing you tell them uh uh, is there I don't, a very first thing you tell uh, Yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily the same, okay. the same thing as this sort of, but I mean, I, I think there's, I know it's intentional. There's a lot of repetition in the way that I explain things. Okay. Um, and it's because I think what is often maybe misunderstood uh, about Islamic geometry is or I think it can appear to be very mysterious. You know, there isn't all this written documentation of how it was done historically. Okay. Um, even now, there isn't, there aren't a lot of books about it. And the ones that there are don't always present the same viewpoint. And often they don't even present the, the kind of the ideal viewpoint that is demonstrated in the historical sites. So it can be hard, you know, it can seem very mysterious. I know that in the first year or so when I was exploring, um, I didn't understand how, you know, I was looking around for how am I going to proportion the elements of this rosette, for example. Yeah. I didn't know that there was a clear way of doing it and clear reasons for doing it that way. Mm. And those reasons relate to um, a higher level of beauty and symmetry in the pattern not only that, but also to the practical application when you're making these things out of materials, a range of materials, but within specific materials, you want a certain quality in a shape. Yeah. And those things need to be. So I think it's kind of this idea of demystifying it a little bit mm. and pointing out that it is very much a systematic rule based art form. Mm it's an art form so you can put all the rules in and there'll still be points where there are deviations but those deviations can be more or less informed as well okay so um so yeah sorry don't don't have a specific thing that i always say at the okay. beginning no that's fine that's fine um yeah. so um obviously we know we you guys just came out of your of the of the lockdown and we're hoping that things will kind of die down in terms of this uh, pandemic but are they are there any any um projects any exhibitions virtual exhibitions any um anything that you're 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 planning to do in the future in the near future that you you would like to let people know about let us know about yeah um I think just in terms of teaching, I'm very excited about uh, going to be running a course with uh, my friend Alan, Alan Adams. Um, we're doing it for the Prince's School and it's based around uh, the notes, sketchbooks and notes of Anthony Lee. Okay. Uh, if you've come across them, but they, they're sort of notes that he made in the 70s and 80s of his own attempts to systematize Islamic geometry. Okay. Um, they never turned into a a, a book. Um, okay. So you know, and they they are developed over a period of time, and they're quite mathematical. They're quite analytically heavy. You know, so they're not that accessible. If you, you know, reading someone's handwritten notes that maybe change throughout the book you know the emphasis might change or the terminology might change as he's developed his ideas it's kind of like a live document and so there are an incredible amount of clear and insightful um ideas within those but pulling them out and giving them a practical application like how do i actually draw this pattern even if i understand the system behind it um so the course we're running is going to take certain specific uh, insights from these notes, okay. uh, explain them, demonstrate them, and do that through practical drawing. Okay. So that course I'm, I'm quite excited about because I think it will be a chance for, especially for people who've done some courses and done some drawing of Islamic pattern, 
to go back to the basics and see how everything is connected, see the, see the kind of system that underlies everything and not have to kind of look at each pattern as a separate entity, you know, to see that they're part of a continuum. Yeah. Um, so that course is coming up in May. It's very yeah. kind of keen, keen to get on with that one. And that might may well turn into a series because there's a lot of stuff in his notes uh, to, to get across uh also got some you know book projects design projects always on the go uh yeah. dode and i are are going to be starting a a venture I won't say too much about it at this point okay. but yeah, it'll all be on on instagram and, uh, and facebook once um once things get going yeah yeah okay okay so where can people um sign up for these courses people that are interested so that specific course is at yeah. the prince's so I, I mean, okay. I'm, I'm uh, the online courses, I'm, I'm either doing them with the Prince's School of Traditional Arts, or I'll be running them myself. Uh, and if they're if they're my own ones, they'll be via my website. Otherwise, they'll be at the PSTA.org okay. site. Okay, okay, cool. Um, Mr. Meet, I'm very, I'm very grateful for your time today. I've learned a lot. Um, Thank you thank very you. much for, for uh, making some time for us. Um, uh, thank, thank you for inviting me. I think it's, uh, you know, watch some of your other talks with, uh, you know, Richard and Adam and Samira and pe people that I know as, as well. As it, and I, I found it found it enlightening to, to hear about other aspects of their practices. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. if, I'd be glad if, uh, you know, anyone finds it interesting. No, I, th I think they will. I think I, I definitely found it interesting. Uh, definitely. And I'm not I'm not even within that geometric um, geometry art space, you know, I'm not a practitioner mm -hmm. by any means. Um, sure. I, I do I do appreciate it, but definitely. But um, I think those that definitely practice it, those students that, of yours and mm -hmm. those are students of other people that you work with and you know about would definitely be appreciated. So thank you very much for your time. Hopefully. Yeah, well, we thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, and definitely we we need to catch up later on once your once your new project comes out um, with with um, Mr. Daoud and what have you. Um, yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you very much, and we'll see you later. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Bye bye.